Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP Jump Haas. With me today, very special guest, technically speaking, former WWF Tag Team Champion, if you want to get technical. Of course, he was a member of the fabulous Rougeau Brothers. Raymond Rougeau, welcome in. How you doing? I'm doing fine, John. How are you? Very good. What's going on in your world? What are you up to? My world? Well, in the city where I live, in Rodden, I'm the mayor. So um, I've been, I'm busy with City Hall, uh, dealing with all sorts of projects and stuff like that. Uh, I've been in politics for a long time, actually. Since 2002, I've been an elected official. Wow. This is my sixth term, uh, first term as mayor. I never wanted to run as mayor before that. Uh, they tried to convince me in 2013 to run for mayor. I didn't want to. In 2017, they tried again. I didn't want to. Finally, I made the, the decision to run in 2021. And uh, I got elected. And my whole team of councillors got elected also. So. Uh, I'm having a, I'm having a good time actually. Now that I'm living it, I regret I should have done it earlier because I uh, I feel I'm really in the right place right now. Man, were you possibly in politics longer than you were in the wrestling business? That would be crazy. It is. It is. My wrestling career itself lasted eighteen and a half years, and it, I've been in politics now. I've been an elected official for twenty one and a half years, so I've been politician longer than I was a wrestler. So if you add it all up, I, w I wrestled for 18 and a half years. I did 17 years of commentary for the WWE. And uh, I'll, for the, I started, in, you know, doing all the French stuff and doing uh, backstage interviews and then uh, interviews live in the ring and then doing the pay-per-views and more and more and more implicated. But I did the commentating and uh, announcer stuff for 17 years. So I had a good time there. But like I said, my longest career has been in politics. Who would have thought? Well, yeah, right. What's a tougher business, wrestling or, or the political game? They're both. They're different, actually. But, you know, the um, wrestling business prepared me for the political career. Because, you know, in the business, uh, you, you, you have to manage a lot of stress. When you you got big angles going on, big matches, there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. You have to deliver at the right time. So there's a lot of uh, pressure on your shoulders and you have to learn to manage that, that stress, let's say, or the pressure you have. In politics, it's the same thing, except um, let's say the difference is in the ring, it hurts more physically, but in politics, they attack you more on a personal level. So the attacks are a little different. But at the same time, uh, like I said, it, the wrestling career prepared me for it because you learn to manage your anxiety, your stress, and the pressure that you have. So in politics, I'll go out and have a meeting, and I could have, let's say, on a certain uh, project we're doing, you could have people that are against it. Um, because whatever decision you make, it's never going to be a unanimous decision. Some people are going to enjoy, are going to be happy with what you're doing on that certain project. Other people won't be happy, but on a different project, you, you know, other the people that weren't happy are happy. You know, bottom line is when our council, when we choose to go forward on a project, we always look at if we please 75 percent of the population, we've done a good job. We made a good choice. So, like I said, dealing with the pressure when you have a certain opposition or something, you manage it and uh, it's going well. You know, so far I, I've, I'm enjoying it. I'm very happy. Now, did the politics of wrestling get you ready for the, you know, the politics as far as, as you know, real life? Yeah, there, well, we all know there are politics in the business. Um, yeah, you deal with it because there's some backstabbing at times. There's some uh, talks that go, go on behind your back or stuff like that that you find out eventually. Sometimes you find out. Things are said by certain people that you liked, actually, and they they were actually working against you, you know, behind the scene. Uh, but you learn to deal with it. And, you know, you develop uh, a protection for all that. And uh, we did it in the business. And you have to look over it. You can't stop and uh, because something hurts your feelings or something you feel bad or you're disappointed or whatever. You can't let it ruin your life. You get over it, you continue, you have to have a message, mission, you have to have a goal, and you keep focused and stay on your goal. Same thing in politics. Now, obviously, the world of the World Wrestling Federation was yeah. 
full of politics and full of politicians. You know, that's, uh, I don't know, I guess like if you're inexperienced or not used to it in wrestling, that can kind of, you know, kill you, so to speak, you know, in, in the business. That could really get to you as far as just the political game backstage of, of the wrestlers. Well, I think uh, mostly young guys coming in because they haven't developed that self-protection yet. They haven't, they don't have the experience of that. And when they they experience it for the first time or second time in the business, it can, it can get to them a lot more. When I joined the WWF back then in 87, uh, in 86, I had already been wrestling 15 years. So I had my experience of backstage politics and whatever. So when I came into the WWF in 1986, I came in with 15 years experience, a lot of baggage. And uh, so it didn't, it didn't affect me that much. And at the same time, I was always pretty much a loner. Um, I never, you know, I never went out in the bars, never drank, never did drugs, never, you know. For me, it was a business. I worked out, I traveled to the next city, found a gym, trained. You know, my brother was with me, the same thing. We travel, we find a gym, work out, uh, eat, rest, go to the building, have the best match we can, get to bed, get up, catch a flight, fly to the next city. It was a business for me. So, and at the same time, I wasn't on that party mode. I wasn't in it for the attention, for the glory. I was there because I enjoyed the sport. I enjoyed the industry, but also it was a financial vehicle to get to a financial independence to where you could be set and not have to work anymore. So it was, it was business. I, I was passionate about my business. I loved the business. But at the same time, as I was making money, I was investing, buying properties, income properties and stuff to make sure that I didn't have to depend on the business or depend on anyone else. When you are doing that, right, and you, you know, you're trying to do right by yourself, you know, look out for your, were the guys in the back like, oh, come on, Ray, like you should be partying or like you should be drinking. And like, did, did they hold that against you at all? Yeah, some guys maybe yes um but I, they, they wouldn't come out straight up to me they again they say oh come on come on with us or come party with us no oh, thanks guys i'm gonna you know eventually they knew i was like different you know vince mcmahon told me once uh because when i came coming i became commentator i was uh, you know around vince a lot uh because you know to give me the idea the orientation of the interviews he wanted us to do or yep. the storyline which way it was going and uh, one morning I was having breakfast with him. We were on the taping somewhere. And he says, oh, come and join me. So anyways, we're, we're eating. And uh, at one point he says, you know, he says, you are so different. He says, it's in our business, it's like you're from another planet. He says, you're completely different from everybody else. I said, well, thank you. I said, I take that as a compliment, you know? And yeah. he, he says, I wish I had more guys like you, you know? So uh, I was loyal and uh, hardworking, never a headache, never a problem, never had to worry. Oh, is he going to go start a fight in a bar or be in trouble? Is that? No, I was always on time, always dependable, always professional, always kept the image of the company up front because it was important. He, he re respected that. Yeah, that's great. But I could definitely see the boys being like Paul Bush. Oh, you don't want to have a drink with us? You're not going to party? You're not going to do that, right? They probably busted you a little bit on it. Yeah, but it, it didn't. I. I'm not influenceable and I accept the fact that I could be different from the crowd, you know? And I, like I said, I had my own agenda. I was there. It was a business. And uh, after that, I retired when I was 34 years old, you know? And when I became commentator after it's because Vince did everything to convince me to come back as commentator because I was going home and I was 34. So how many guys, you know, Back then, like we weren't making millions like they are today. We made good money, but it wasn't, you know, I mean, we're 30 years later, you know, yep. 28 years later. But at the same time, how many guys at 34 can say they can go and retire and enjoy their lives? Not too many. Right. So at the same time, some of the guys, let's say back then that were in that party mood or, you know, they say, ah, oh, he's, he's this or he's that because he won't be with us. He won't join us. After that, a lot of them, were giving me or citing me as an example to the younger guy, you know, look at him. He was smart. He did the right thing. You know, he did this. I was often uh, congratulated or uh, 
you know, just for the, the choices I made and the lifestyle that I had. So, you know, when you're young, you're in the party mood, you look, well, maybe he's a creep because he won't have fun with us. But later on, they say, boy, he was smart, you know, and I'm healthy. I'm in good shape. I work out 28 days a month. I work out every day. This morning, I worked out for an hour, 45 minutes before going to City Hall. And I do that. That's in my schedule. Every day I work out. You know, and I'm 69 years old. I'm in great shape. You know, I could swim a mile. I, you know, I do weightlifting, cardio, stretching. I jump rope. Uh, I can run. I can do anything. I'm 69 years old. How many guys can still do that? So I must have had a good recipe or made some right choices along the road. For sure. Where do you get all that energy from? Jeez, that's crazy. It's it's the healthy lifestyle. I get I, good genetics. It starts, you know, because. I mean, you know, you could be born with bad genetics, that's not your fault. I was fortunate to have good genetics, but at the same time, you know, life can offer you a certain, they'll deal you a deck, of, a, a hand of cards. You have to play with the cards you dealt with. Fortunately, life set me out with a good, you know, with a good hand, but then I played it to the max. You know, like I always say, you, you, you make the best choices possible, you can lead a healthy, healthy lifestyle. Uh, you know, I'll be corny here, but you know, train, take your vitamins, sleep right. You know, like, oh, but yeah. I mean, I did that, and and then after that, you cross your fingers and hope for the best. So I put the chance. I had the genetic, but then I put the chances on my side also, and then hope for the best. And you know, so far it's um, it's paid off for me. Now, going back to Vince, did you always have a good relationship with him just as far as being friendly with him? And and yeah. obviously he, he liked you. So what was the relationship like with Vince? He respected me a lot. I mean, that's I think that was the base of it. He he respected me and he and he saw like when I was on the road wrestling for three and a half years, he never had reliability problems or or, or issues or whatever i was a solid guy always there you know and um he knew i didn't drink he knew i didn't party he knew i didn't take drugs steroids whatever he was like wow so i think he respected that in our business and i was never influenceable so when i became actually where i became closer to him is when i became commentator because like i said i spent more time every taping we went to I'd go into his office and I spend a half an hour, an hour with him and we'd go over the interviews I was going to do when he wanted to give me the, the direction of the interview he wanted and stuff like that. So he had some one-on-one -on -one time with me and he, he liked me. He says, damn, this is a hell of a nice guy, you know, and reliable. You know, back when there was the big competition, WCW and all that, and all the guys were jumping ship, I had been approached to go to WCW uh, to, if I would be interested in doing the French commentating for them because they were trying to expand also. I just I just said, don't call me again. I will never double cross Vince. I appreciated the opportunity I got to go to the WWF. Uh, I, I, like I said, I appreciated the opportunity I got to travel the world, to be with the biggest organization in the world. And when I was done, I mean, I didn't get kicked out. I, I wanted to leave. My brother and I, we gave our notice. And, you know, uh, in, uh, right after SummerSlam 1989, we gave our notice to finish. We gave him a three-month notice. We wanted to finish at Survivor Series 89, which was three months. So it gives, like I told Vince, it gives you a chance to bring in a new team, start building them. So we fade out. You bring the other one. There's not even a little dent in your organization. He was flabbergasted. That's, that's never done. You know, back then I was like, Guys would just quit and oh, you're this, you're that. And uh, he, you know, he even told us, he says, give me a week and I'll make you guys an offer you can't refuse. I've only just begun what I wanted to do with you guys. I have so many plans. I said, Vince, I said, you have to understand, the business here is grueling. You're on the road. It's a grind. You're, you know, back then we we're on the road all the time. I only got home five days a month and not five consecutive days. So... Um, I said, I just want to go home. And he, yeah, but just hear me out. And I said, Vince, I have only, I only have two words for you. His eyes kind of looked up because sometimes it's not a compliment that's coming. I said, thank you. 
I said, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for what I was able to live here, you know, to, to experience. But I said, I just want to go home. Please respect that. And he was like, wow. That's when he said, I need to find a way to keep him. He told other people that he works with. That's where he came up with the idea of me becoming commentator. You know, and when he, they approached me with it, says, Ray, how would you like to become commentator, do interviews? I said, I never had any formal training for that. I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. You know, being interviewed and inter doing the interview is two different things. But Vince says, ah, oh, you'll do great. Don't worry about it. So I learned on the field. And uh, I remember the first night he had me do an interview replacing Gene Okerlund, doing a live interview on the stage. It was with Doink the Clown. Yeah, we we're in Milwaukee, I think it was. And they wanted to try him in a live interview because Gene wanted some time off and stuff. And they said, let's try Ray. I was nervous because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't used to that. And uh, I remember that night when I went and I, I got with Vince first and with Doink and, we, you know, we went over the interview. We went out and did it live on the stage. When I came back, Vince says, Ray, he says, you're very articulate. He says, you come across very clear and the camera likes you. He says, I like that. And from then, I did it for years after that, you know, doing the live interviews on the ring until Vince started doing them himself before he became Mr. McMahon eventually, you know. But I did it for a long time. And I, then I had me doing the segments face to face. Um, you know, you remember those segments face to face we used to have? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm the only one that when we started that, I was on the first. So, you know, first uh, taping of that, that went right till I stopped doing it. So there was me and Gene Okerlin, then there was me and Stan Lane, and then me and somebody else, but it was always me and somebody else, you know? I did the yep. whole face-to-face -face, uh, era. And, uh, but like I said, as we went along, they, they implicated me more and more, and I, and I really enjoyed it. And that's where I got to know Vince, and I got to appreciate him. And you know, there's one thing, you know, I mean, notwithstanding what's going on right now and all that, I mean, it's it's a sad situation. It, you know, I I don't know what to say about that. You know, I wasn't there. I have no knowledge of it. I, I, I read what I read on the social media and stuff like that. And on wrestling sites, I see what's going on. I find it sad. Uh, I can't condone it if it is true. I can't condone the actions. But at the same time, I felt it's split emotions you know i can't agree with that but at the same time i'm sad for the person that brought wrestling to the level that he did that you know we used to be in small arenas around the country this and that to become a mega industry multi-billion dollar industry around the world in all the different countries and to brought it to where it was that won't be his legacy the legacy will be just the end you know, that part I find sad because, I mean, it's life and, and I understand it is what it is. But I wish that had not have happened. So where in the history books of professional wrestling, you would have had who brought wrestling to an international a star level where guys make millions a year. Vince did that, you know. But you know, like I said, it, it's it is what it is. Yeah, you just hope hope it's not true. Obviously, that it's a legacy killer. Oh, absolutely. But like I said, you know, there hasn't been a trial yet. But you know, you just read what you read, and everybody can have an opinion on it. Um, but at the same time, you know, like it says, you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, I would hope, I would wish that it is not true. You know, yep. so this way, you know, he could maybe have the legacy he deserves. And if it is, unfortunately, uh, it won't be the same legacy. Plus, it's a whole different guy than the guy you knew. You know what I mean? It kind of plays yeah. with your psyche a little bit there. Oh, well, back, you know, back then. I'm talking, you know, 19, uh, when I was doing those. I mean, I started the commentating at, at the end of 1989. And whereas a lot with Vince is right up until 1997. So for about eight years. I never saw anything like that. I always saw a cool guy. And you know one thing? You know, a lot of guys don't like Vince. Some guys will. Some guys won't. I I can't say anything about it. He, you know, he was nice to me. 1997, I went through a bit of a hard time. I went through a divorce. It was, you know, I still kept working. But, you know, a divorce is not a fun thing for anybody. 
And Vince heard about it, not through me, because I, I didn't talk about it, but he heard about it. And we were at a pay-per-view. And uh, when we were done with the production meeting, as we were leaving, he says, uh, Ray, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. How are you? He says, good. He says, uh, when I'm done here, so I'd like to have a word with you. I'd like to have a talk with you. I said, okay, fine. I had no clue what he wanted to talk to me about. He took me into a side room and he started, he says, I, I hear you're going through a hard time right now. Well, yeah, kind of, you know. And I was doing the French commentating live on the pay-per-view that night. And he said, I hear you're going through a hard time. I said, yeah. He says, talk to me. And, you know, we started talking. Kevin Dunn knocked at the door. He says, Vince, we need to see you. He says, we've got a technical problem. I need to talk to you. He says, not right now. He says, I'm talking with Ray. And I said, Vince, you go, no. He says, you're my priority right now. So, and so we kept talking. And then Kevin Dunn knocks on the door again. He says, Vince, please, we need to talk to you. We're going on the air soon, you know, like in an hour live on pay-per-view. Yep. Vince, please, we need to talk to you. He says, I told you not now. I'm talking with Ray. So we kept going. I said, Vince, go, to, you know, you got to show it. He says, no, you're my priority. That touched me. I mean, you know, he's got a pay-per-view going on you know, all over the country live. I'm his priority at that point. He wants to make sure of my well-being. And we kept going for a, another 10 minutes. It knocked. He says, Vince, please. He says, we're live. And I really need, he says, don't disturb me again. And he said, and I said, Vince, please go. You got a show to run. And I said, I appreciate it. He gave me his personal phone number. And he says, Ray, you need to talk to somebody. You want to call? You call me. He said, two in the morning, three in the morning. That's the phone next to my bed. You call me and I'll, and I'll answer. You need to talk to somebody. I said, I appreciate that. I never called him. You know, I mean, you know, I'm a grown man. I went through it and all that. But just that opportunity, just the fact everybody's there begging, please, please, he says, don't raise my priority right now. And he wanted to make sure for my well-being. And he gives me his home number. You call me anytime, day or night, you call me. For, I never forgot that, you know. So with everything that goes on, I still remember that. Because when you're going through a difficult time and somebody's there and really wants to help you, you don't forget that. You know, I mean, who am I then? He could have just said, well, good luck, and I hope you do well, you know. Yep. That, that wasn't it. And he gave me advice, and he gave me different things. I said, wow, you know. Uh, and I remember I told him that when I had been approached by WCW, my brother had gone to WCW with Pierre Calouillet and all that. Yep. And I knew people around him were going to say, can you trust Ray? And I mean, that's not the type of guy I am, you know. And we we're in San Antonio, Texas. I still remember. And it was a Survivor Series. We're coming down the ramp. All of a sudden, I turned, Vince was coming down. And he was with Jack and Jerry Briscoe, with Pat Patterson, Bruce Pritchard. They were all coming down. As I waited, when he got there, I said, Vince, can I have a word with you for a second? He said, sure. He came over and I said, you know, this is a small world, small business. And I'm sure you heard that, you know, my brother and Pierre are gone to WCW. And I'm sure people around you are going to question, can you trust Ray? He says, yeah. So I said, there was huge pillars holding the Coliseum, you know, huge cement pillars. I said, Vince, you see that pillar right there? I said, I'm as solid for you with your company as this pillar is to this building. I said, you never have to worry about me. I'll never double cross you. And he took me, took me there, gave me a hug. He says, Ray, I wish I had more guys like you. I said, Vince, I always consider you my friend. I never forgot that time when, like I said, I was going through a hard time. He was there for me. He was going through a hard time because WCW was going up and up, you know. Yeah. Killing him. Hey, I said, I'll sink with the ship with you, you know. So, you know, that's, I mean, that's the type of guy I am. And at the same time, there was a respect. And Vince always liked me for that. And, uh, you know, so that's that's all I can say about Vince, you know. How'd you get in originally? Like, does, no, is that through Vince? No, no. I tried to know Vince. He didn't know me. It was Pat Patterson. Uh Actually, uh, I got a phone call one night. Edward Carponzi, do you remember him? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Edward was good friends with mine, and he was doing commentating with Guy Ori for the French version of WWF back then. 
they wanted to expand into the French market. They wanted to get into Montreal. They wanted to go to France, Belgium, and all that. They needed French talent. Pat Patterson had spoken to uh, Vince about us, about my brother and I. And um, Pat and I had worked together. We were tag team champions here in Quebec before he was an agent at, with Vince. We were tag team uh, partners, tag team champions. He turned heel on me. We worked a program, worked through the territory. We had our matches. He knew that I could work. He knew my brother could work. So he told Vince, Vince, I got these two guys, you know, that would be great for the company, you know, and would touch this French market. So anyways, he's, they, they approached us and they went through Edward Carpentier. So Edward called me, he says, how are you? I hadn't spoken to him in a while. And he says, how are you? And all that, I said, I'm fine, thanks. And he says, you know, he says, your place is with the WWF. I said, nobody's ever talked to me about it. He says, I know they're interested in you and all that. And I'd mentioned to Edward, I said, look, I've never thought about it. All I heard is they're on there. They never get home. They're always on the road, you know, and all that. But look, he says, why don't you just hear them out? I said, well, I'm flying to Miami tomorrow morning at a house in Florida. I said, I'm flying to Miami tomorrow morning. I gave the number, tell them to call me there. I should be at my house at two tomorrow afternoon. So if they want to talk to me, call me there. And I said, there's one thing. Uh, I want to make sure. First of all, if I go, I'm going, I'm going with my brother. We're going together. Uh, second of all, I just want to make sure they're going to take care of us. They just want us to bring us in because we had a good reputation here. In this, and I didn't need to go there. I was doing fine, you know. But at the same time, who doesn't want to go to the biggest organization in the world at one point if you have the opportunity? I'm like, it's like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity Am I going to turn it down? But I wasn't really tempted to go, you know. But so anyways, I said, if they take care of us, I'm not saying let's push us to the top. No, but if they're going to bring us in just to, you know, to work and put guys over and be jobbers and then go home, you know, kill us and then we go home, I'm not interested. If they want, you know, if, if we're going to have a decent run, we can be part of the crew. I said, okay, they can call us. And uh, the next day, Two o'clock, my phone rang in Florida, and they called. It was uh, Terry Garvin that called me. And he says, Vince would like to meet with you. I said, okay, when? He says, when could you come up? I said, well, I said, I'm going back to Montreal next week. I said, I could fly to New York. If you guys fly me to New York, you know, uh, I'll go. So anyway, so the following week, they flew my brother from Montreal to New York, me from Miami to New York. And uh, they had a limousine waiting for us, brought us to Stanford. We sat, had a meeting with Vince at the headquarters with Pat Patterson, and uh, that's where we came to uh, an agreement, and that's where we then we started with them. That's how that came about. And after that, well, then they, they were able to uh, develop the French market. And uh, like the first show we did in Paris, my brother and I went to the main events, and it was sold out in Paris, you know. So, uh, so it, like I said, it helped for his um, big plan of conquering the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And you guys are baby faces at first. So obviously you're going to feud with, you know, the Funks and the Moon Dogs, the Dream Team, and especially the, the Heart Foundation. Did you like being baby faces and facing all those good heel tag teams? I was baby face my whole life until we turned the heel at the end. So for me, it was just natural. It, what, there wasn't ever could, uh, for a consideration of anything else. So we came in and yeah, it was natural for me to work baby face. But the only thing was after a while, you know, like, you know, we all, we all, the American people are very patriotic. And then they had two Canadians, but even worse, French Canadians coming in as baby faces, wrestling against a lot of American teams. So a lot of people were having a hard time bringing themselves to say, we're going to cheer for French Canadians that are over our American compatriots, let's say, you know. So we were stuck kind of in the middle. Uh, Half the crowd, or even let's say 60% of the crowd liked us, were bay faced, but 40%, uh, or let's say out of the 40, 20% were like, we can't cheer for these guys. They're wrestling against our fellow Americans. And there were 20% that's like, go back to Canada or whatever. So we were like stuck in the middle there. And after, uh, I'd say about a year, a year and a half, we saw it was, we were like, we had hit a plateau. 
And the worst place to be is caught in the middle in, in wrestling. You want to be hated or you want to be loved. We were caught in the middle. So we had had a little discussion, my brother and I. We joked about it, actually. We said, you know, what do you think? Maybe we should turn heel. My brother and I laughed because in our family, it had only ever been baby faces our whole lives and our, our uncles, fathers. It was, you know, generation after generation. And we said, yes, you know, they're... They, a lot of people are looking for a reason to hate us. We're not giving it to them, but some of them are already hating us. We said, maybe we should turn heel. And it's funny because the following week or the week after, um, an agent told us, Vince wants to meet with you guys. He flew us from, I don't remember where, we're on the road. He flew us to New York, had us come to the headquarters, and then flew us back out to go to the shot wherever we were going that night. And then, so we get to headquarters. We had no clue what it was about. And he says, hey, guys, how are you? So we start talking about five minutes into it. He says, uh, how would you guys feel about maybe turning heel? And my, my brother and I looked at each other, and we both started to laugh. We said, Vince, we talked about that about two weeks ago, you know. And then we started elaborating. And Vince came up with the idea of the fabulous Rougeau brothers, the little American flags, how the turn would be done because – nor, you know, many times, how many times you have two baby face teams work out, son, one will pull a cheap shot on the other one, and then you turn heel because he didn't pull the cheap shot. Vince didn't want to go that way. He wanted to do it a slow transition over like three months. And uh, over the three months, he says, slowly, you know, so he had us working with baby face teams. Uh, we'd work baby face, but once in a while, whoops, like a little, okay, we'll just grab a rope to get out of a hold. Once in a while, just to get take the shortcut out, people would say, hey, come on, that's a cheat, that's cheat, guys. But we kept working babyface. Then we started working the, the interviews coming in. Because I asked Vince, how do you plan on doing this? So that so he said it would be slow. He says, I'm gonna have you come in with the little American flags, and you're gonna start telling how much you love the United States of America and how much and I said, You really think they're gonna hate us for that? He says, oh, yes, they will. He says, because we're going to lay it on so thick that they're going to be, hey, these guys are full of it, you know, and this and that. So that's how we started the beginning. And even our song that we, you know, the All-American Boys, that was done with Jimmy Hart, my brother, myself. We're, you know, parts were in English, parts in French. In English, we're like, you know, saying how much we love the United States and, you know, uh, in French, we were knocking the United States, you know, but being nerdy, like saying, oh, we're saying it in the French, they'll never know what we're saying, right? Like they can't find out, you know, but that's what we wanted them to do, you know? So we're kind of playing two games, making mistakes on holidays, like let's say uh, Memorial Day, we'll say it's Independence Day, and then people say, they're so such idiots. It's not Memorial Day, it's Independence Day, you know? But we're doing it smiling, and we love it. We're going to move to the United States, and we became very nerdy. And Vince was right within – it took you know, when the turn was done in about three months, that's that was the planning we made. We were one of the most hated teams in the WWF back then, you know. And that's when we – then we started really turning heel. And then we had Jimmy Hart as a manager. We did the, the angle with the Rockers where, you know, we injured Shawn Michaels, you know, and then we had the program with them. Now we were full-fledged heels. And to be honest, that's the most fun I had in my whole career. I, I loved working heel. Wow, your whole career. So th it must have been great because you guys, I mean, you guys were awesome. Like just that, that gimmick is great. Just everything. And the crowd absolutely hated you guys. It was perfect. That was the goal. And, but you know what? The cards were, everything was in place. You know, sometimes where everything just falls right. We were with Jimmy Hart. I couldn't have asked for a better guy to be our manager. Uh, and, you know, we didn't ask. Vince says, I'm going to put Jimmy Hart with you guys and all that. Jimmy is such a dedicated guy. He is so dedicated to his team. He's always trying to put the spotlight on his team. He's always there, but he's always putting the attention. He's not trying to gob up all the heat. No, he's always there. He's always annoying for the fans, but he wants to, to put make his team shine. And he's always willing to talk business he's very professional uh super great human being great guy we'd have talks sometimes 
Hey, say hey guys, I have an idea. I hope you don't mind. Oh, come on, Jimmy. We sit down and we talk for hours about things we could do, things we could come up with, innovations, you know, and this and that. Even when we were uh, composing the lyrics to the song, it was so much fun working with Jimmy. So like I said, everything together, my brother and I, we had different styles, but our styles complemented each other. Um, my, my brother was more of a high flyer. I was more technical. Uh, but at the same time, I was, let's say, I had a more rugged style. And my brother was more cocky and arrogant. We complemented each other so well. And with Jimmy there, it just added the uh, cherry on the sundae. You know, everything fell into place. You know, it was great. It was a blast. I mean, I loved it. Hey, it's one of the greatest theme songs of all time, too, the All-American Boys, right? I mean, that was such a good theme song. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I'm still implicated a little bit in, in, the, in the business. What I mean is I'm not working anymore, you know, in, in wrestling and stuff because, you know, I had come back in 2017 with the WWE because they had called me back to come uh, for, to do all the French commentating for the uh, pay-per-views. We are doing 12 pay-per-views a year. And uh, so they fly me in, me and Jean Brassard that lives in New York. Him and I were the French commentators for all the pay-per-views for right up until the pandemic. And the, then the pandemic came along, the borders were shut, there were no more audiences, you know, things changed. Um, after that, uh, the network was sold to Peacock in the United States. They weren't exactly interested in all the foreign languages, all that, you know. The, so basically that's where it ended. They still broadcast in French, but it's it's changed. It's uh, two two local broadcasters, French broadcasters in Paris, that are there. So when they do a pay per view now, they just leave their house. They go in studio. They're looking at it on a monitor. They're calling the event. When they're done, they put the headset down, go home, go to bed. Back then, we were flying into the, where the event was the day before. So they're paying for our airfare, hotel, paying us our food or whatever. And uh, we you know we we're gone for like uh, two. Well, 40 an hour. I leave on Saturday, the pay-per-view is on Sunday, and I fly back home on Monday. But for them, pay-per-views at, you know, let's say 7 o'clock, they'll be in studio at 5.30 preparing, and the pay-per-view's done at 11, 11 30, they're home. They have no expense, so it's a lot cheaper for the company. Yep. Um, and, they, you know, they're always looking to cut costs, which is a normal thing to do when you're a business, you know. You, you can take the wrestler out of the ring, but you don't take the ring out of the wrestler. You know, and that's that's in you. I've been I've been a competitor my whole life. Even if wrestling is a work, you're still a competitor and you're out to compete to do the best match you can. And I always took pride in being in the best shape I could be. Uh, I was always, like I said, top shape. When I came back for that match, you remember the boxing match I had with Owen Hart? Yes, yes. I've been out of the ring six and a half years, almost six and three quarter years when I came back to do that match. The, the only reason I came back, for me, I never retired officially. So I could come back tomorrow and they can't say, hey, he retired, I never retired. Right. But because too many guys retire and come back, I don't like that. I just never retired because I quit at 34. Who knows? I could have come back a couple of times, you know, whatever, if I felt like it. And I didn't want anybody to feel cheaped out because they said I went to a supposedly final match and then he came back again. I, if, if I would have done it, it would have been a special moment and it's over. But I never announced it, so I left it open. You know, um, my son was born five months after I retired. I never wanted to have a child while I was on the road and not being there. So when I agreed to, okay, we could start thinking of having a a family it was like in the summer of 89 because i knew by the end of 89 i was gone i had already it was four months already in my mind it wasn't a spur of the moment decision it's in the spring of 89 i was already ready to, to retire but i said i'm going to give myself at least three months to continue on the road in case it's just a phase i'm going through and then you know i leave and then i call can i come back and no, if I'm gone, I'm gone. So I took three months to reflect on it from March 89. I gave my notice at the end, uh, end of August. So April, May, June, July, almost five months later, I gave my notice. But a couple of months before, I knew I was going to quit. 
So I said, okay, we could try, you know, for a family. My wife got pregnant. And my son was born in April of 90. So I retired from the road uh, November 89. He was born in April of 90. So from the moment he was born, I was home. Him and I are like best friends in the world. I mean, in the world. Uh, we're not like father and son. Yes, the respect is there as the father and son. But we're the best friends in the world. And, um, you know, I fly. I have my own airplane. I've been flying for actually this year is going to be, uh, what was it, 84. It's 40 years. Actually, it was 40 years, two weeks ago, that I got my pilot's for license. Nice. I've been flying for 40 years. My son right now is 34. So I was flying before he was born, before he, when he, before he was uh, even a thought, you know. Uh, I was flying with him on my knees when he was a kid. I'd have him, you know, I'd have fun. He's an airline pilot now. He's captain with Air Transat Airline Company, uh, you know. On the big jets, 400 passengers in back. He's 34 years old. I like to think that I might have had an influence on that because when he was two years old, I had him on my knees pulling on the yoke of the plane when we were flying. And now yeah. he's a pilot. But when he was a kid, when I retired, I was doing the commentating every week. And as it, like all the kids, he would watch the uh, WWE shows every week and he'd see me doing the interviews. And I had. You know, back then we had tapes, you know, the VHS tapes and all yep. that, and DVDs. So he'd watch me and the thing, and he's like, wow. And when he was like four years old, he says, Dad, am I ever going to see you wrestle in the ring one time? You know, I didn't want to say no, but I didn't want to say yes. For me, my career was over. I'd be gone four years. So I said, well, who knows? Maybe one day, maybe one day. I figured it would pass. It never did. And then... Every, you know, every six months or whatever. Dad, you said maybe I'd see you in the ring one day. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, one day. When I got to 1996, um, I was uh, 41 years old at that point. And he says, Dad, am I going to see you? I'm like, okay. And I, you know, I didn't want to disappoint him. And I, and I never lied to him. I said, maybe one day. I could always come up. I, I, wouldn't say, I only said maybe, but I didn't want that. I said... Maybe this year. And I went to see Vince. And that's where I came up with the idea of the boxing match. I said, Vince, I'd like to do, I'd like to come back, do a, ma do a, a match in Montreal. I said, I'd like to do a boxing match. Vince says, boxing match? Why do you want to do a boxing match? I said, I always like boxing. My, my father was a Golden Glove champion in boxing. He taught me to box when I was young. And um, so I said, because I said, I've been gone out of the ring for six years now, over six years. And for me to, to get into this, I was still in good shape, but I wanted to get in better shape than even when I was wrestling. I said, for me to get the motivation to train, to do what I want to do, I need to have an extra stimulation. For, as far as to come back to a wrestling match, I've done it. I've, you know, I've been around the block twice and it's, I've seen it, been there, done that. I said, I'd like to do a boxing match. He says, okay. And Vince liked me, he says, fine. I said, my son wants to see me in the ring, you know. So we did it. And we did a big thing. I trained for basically seven and a half months to do that one boxing match. I cut my weight down by 20 pounds. Not that I was heavy, because when I quit the business, I was at 224. Okay. They had introduced us at 228. My real weight was 224. When I became commentator, I cut my weight down to 214. Because a lot of guys, when they quit the business, they get big, you know. And I said, uh, uh, uh. I cut down to 214, and I stayed there for seven years. Then when I went to the boxing match, I cut down to 194. But I had a six-pack, and I was 41. I had a six-pack, I mean, which I didn't have a six-pack when I was wrestling. I was in good shape, but I didn't have a six-pack. Then I had, I was doing, hitting the heavy bag every day. I was uh, sparring 10 rounds. I was hitting the uh, speed bag, jumping rope uh, 20 minutes a day, running five miles a day, doing 1,500 sit-ups a day. And I did that for seven months because I wanted, when I came in, I didn't want people to see I'm come in the ring. I, I retired at 34. They were going to see me again at 41. I didn't want them to say, oh, boy, he aged that. Oh, it's too bad. Yeah, they had a memory. And then I come back. It's like, oh, disappointing. When I came back, it was like. Jesus Christ, 
what did you do? You know? Yes. So uh, I came back and that's, that's the kind of shape I was in. My son was at ringside in the front row. And uh, I worked, it was with Owen Hart that I did that match. In my corner, I had a former uh, middleweight contender in Quebec that had boxer, professional boxer that I was good friends with. I trained with him. I went to a gym. I did box, boxing training with him. I did uh, sparring with him. Uh, you know, I mean, we did hit the, the bags, you know, I hit the gloves. Um, so there was my dad in my corner and there was him. In Owen Hart's corner, he had Jim Cornette and he had George Chavallo. George Chavallo is a former heavyweight champion. He boxed with Muhammad Ali, went 15 rounds with Muhammad Ali. So we made it a big thing. And we did a press conference in Montreal and all that. So the night of the event, we had a hell of a show. It was first show at the Bell Center, which was like the new forum in Montreal. And it was the Bolson Center back then when it was open. Now it's the Bell Center where they have their shows right now. Uh, it was the first WWE show then. We, we did our match. At the end, I went over. My son, he was six years old. And he's looking for him. It's his dad. I mean, during, well, Owen's getting the heat on me. My son was there holding onto the barricades, looking, you know, because his dad's getting, you know, having a hard time. Yep. And I even had a nosebleed in the match and everything, you know. Owen hit me on the nose. He got me good, which was fine. But uh, my son's looking. And at the end, when I won, my son was, and then I had the usher give me my son. And I, had, I brought him in the ring, and I took him in my arms. And I've got that picture laminated on my wall. And uh, I've got my son in my arms. I've got my hand raised. He's got his hand raised. Like, you know, my dad's my hero. Yeah. I gave him that spot he had asked me for. Will I ever see you in the ring? I gave it to him, and I even had him up in the ring. So, you know, the, so the passion is there. I mean, who trains seven and a half months for a working match? Right. You know, yep. I do. Yeah. So that's the type of person I am. So, you know. I love it. Awesome moment for you and your son, too, obviously. I mean, very, very cool stuff there. Yes, sir, it is. As we hit the wind down here, we head towards the finish. What is next for you? I mean, we're just doing politics and, and a little bit of, of wrestling as far as with Jacques and his school, or will will you be doing even more in wrestling? The door's open. You know, when they, when my contract ended, when they put an end to it with the WWE because of the pandemic and the things changed, you know, I said, well, I said, look, because I was always on good terms with them. And I said, I understand it's business. You know, because... I remember when the producer called me, he said, I hate to make this phone call. You know, I said, hey, I understand. It's business. You know, they've been paying me for a year sitting home doing nothing. I said, I don't understand why they even paid me for a year staying home doing nothing. They didn't have to. In the contract, right. put an end for, you know, major reasons. For me, the, the, um, the pandemic was a major reason. But, you know, Vince wanted to honor it, you know, pay and all that. So they said, but you know, it's coming to an end. And I said, hey, no problem. And I said, look, yeah, in a way I'm disappointed because I really enjoyed what I was doing. But at the same time, I understand and there are no ill feelings. So I said, you know, hey, the door's always open. You know, if something comes up, give me a call and I'll be glad to jump back into the seat, you know. And uh, they told me, he says, Ray, you know, the door will always be open for you with the WWE. And he says, unless you decide to close it. I said, I'm not closing it. I like to keep my options open. And if something comes up, hey, yeah, if it works, we'll come and we'll have fun. So that, you know, we never know. I don't count on it and I don't expect it to happen. But who knows? In 2017, when they called me to come back, I didn't expect I'd been gone for 15 years. But, you know, for me, it was over. Like, all of a sudden, I'm back into it, you know? Yep. And I enjoyed it again. So I said, the door's always open. At the same time, if my brother does shows like that and asks me to help him, you know, give him a hand to come and be commentator. If I, if, you know, this, where I am now in life and the situation I'm in, I mean, I've worked my whole life. I've, made, I've paid my dues, sacrificed. I put myself in a position. I want to have fun now. You know, the first question I asked when Tom Carlucci, he was producer of the WWE, he called me. He says, Ray, he says, how would you, you know, how would you feel about coming back doing the commentary and all that? 
my first question, I said, what's the schedule? I didn't want to be back on the road. He says, we're doing one a month. We'll fly in on Friday, on Saturday. You do the show Sunday, fly home Monday, you're off for a month. I said, okay. I didn't even ask what the salary was. I didn't care. I said, you know, I said, basically, Tom, my only requirement is I want to have fun. At the stage of my life now, I can afford to choose what I want to do, when I want to do it, and I want to have fun. So if I'm going to go and I'm going to have a good time, I'm in. And I said, pay me what you pay the other guys. That's not in the negotiation. You know, pay me what you pay the other guys. That's fine. I'm not here trying to negotiate this or that. Pay me what you pay the other guys. That's fine. I just want to have my criteria. I want to have fun. If I'm not having fun, I said, is there a way I can get out of the, the contract we want to do? I said, I, I want to have a way out. If I'm not enjoying myself, I want to stay home. He says, no problem. He says, Ray, you're going to have a blast. I said, thank you. I did it for almost four years and uh, three and a half years before the pandemic. I had a great time and I'd go back again. So same with my brother. He says, you want to try it? I tried it. I had a blast. So this year, so I got the four shows. You want to do them? Count me in. I'm there. So I choose what I want to do. You know, there's an, an I want to continue in politics. I'm having a, a really great time being the mayor. You know what stimulates me the most about being a mayor? Some people could say, oh, you must like the power, this and that. No. It's the challenge, the mental stimulation that I get. I'm constantly dealing with professionals, architects, lawyers, getting uh, you know, legal advice. This You learn so much. And it's so mentally, intellectually stimulating. That's what feeds me. That's what drives me. So I want to continue. And uh, like I said, there's so many things that I'm doing right now, so many projects that I realize that when I drive, you know, I come up, drive around the city, and I'm like, wow, I remember that project. I remember it when it was on the drawing board. I remember the meetings we had. And it's there. It's live. It's concrete. People are enjoying it. That I'm fueled by that. So I want to. I would like to continue in politics. Basically, in 2025 is the next election, November 20. In a year and a half, I plan on running again for another term, and um, so continue with politics. If something comes up with the wrestling, if it, if it's interesting and fun, yeah, 